bring in some more chicken. There we go. There we go. Way to go. Oh, very good. Oh, one of them is broken. That's bad. No, no, no. The, the calories leak out of this. Yeah, no calories bad for Oh, how that work? Yeah. Randy, are you hosting tonight? I am yes. hosting tonight. Okay, so I, I need a couple of spots, maybe a spot to talk about some of the SIGs yes. and um, also something to talk about the Pacific uh, School of Innovation and Inquiry. I should make some notes. <clears throat> And we're going to start with Ron, if that's okay with you. If that's okay with me. I was going to say the Chris's are twins tonight. Yeah. <laughs> Not bad. Vancouver Rask. Got the same jacket. <laughs> oh, I bought it. <laughs> Ditto. Yeah, you bought yours too. They weren't giving any away. <laughs> mm. And can you remind me your name? Ashish. Ashish. I think I know you only from emails. Yeah, just sit on. So these books are for sale if anybody wants to take a gander at them. My suggested prices, and you may say, are you crazy? Or you may want to pay me more, I don't know. The only reason I'm getting rid of that one, Chris, is because I have two copies. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I have to finish my cookie and then I think we'll start. <clears throat> yeah, people still showing up, okay. <coughs> I thought I, I thought I'd see things in three yeah. dimensions today. <laughs> well, I go for that. It's more fun. Yeah. <laughs> so how did, in the good old days, did you get people to bring lots of stuff on? Well, we had a night. And then we actually circulated a list of stuff. Oh, that's clever. I remember when there were actually telescopes and things. I thought, yeah. I bought... Reg's um, That's right. old task yeah. that night. Where's Reg? Uh, he may show up on the table. Heavens. I keep having a book. He lent me and I keep, mm -hmm. so the third week in a row I brought it hoping to see him. Well, Laurie's turned on her camera. I think we're going to start. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, to the December 5th version of the uh, Victoria Center Astro Cafe. It is my privilege to be hosting tonight with uh, technical assistance from Ashish and uh, Chris. And um, as is often the case, we never quite know where it's going to go, but we do have the, well, look who's here. We have a distinguished guest from Edmonton that's just arrived. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Somebody we only yeah, have to say hi. Keep going. Keep going. Yeah, the web camera's in there. there. You're in it now. Somebody's got to be there. <laughs> uh, Alice Link from uh, Are you going to say anything tonight? We'd love you yes, to. Yes, I just did. <laughs> <laughs> like, 
chair over there. Or Where's the ring? Anyway, yeah, we're, we're going to start. The camera view there. Ron Fisher. Uh, oh, maybe not. Hold on. We'll get it in. Is it that you volunteered or you were voluntold to give this presentation? <laughs> voluntold, volunteered. Um, I'm okay. going to. Say. I'm looking forward to this. I am. I'm kind of envious. I. It. It seems that the astrophotography sig is where the 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 interesting discussions are going on, and uh, I, I. I'm. Every time I hear about what goes on in there, I think, wow, but the the timing hasn't worked for me. So every time you guys that are doing astrophotography sig, tell us about what's going on. It it adds to our quality of life. And I gather, Ron, you're a newbie. Well, I'm going to first of all see if I can uh, get up here. I'm I'm not there, right? Uh, we just see you. We don't see your screen yet. You're not seeing me yet. Can you see me now? Absolutely. Yep. OK. Um, I'm going to just very quickly go over uh, my struggle to try to become an astrophotographer. Uh, and I spent yesterday and today just looking at stuff and going through my notes and realizing, I, I guess I've learned quite a bit in the last couple of years. Um, this is a photograph of uh, my first telescope that my wife, Nicole, bought me as a surprise present from uh, Bruce Lane for Christmas uh, 2018. That was my first uh, try at it. She absolutely lied to me. She told me we were going to Victoria to buy a blow up Santa Claus. And we ended up going to Bruce's place and I had to stay in the car while they loaded uh, these big boxes into the back of my car and they were marked blow up Santa Claus. So this, <laughs> this, was, this was my start and uh, uh, it was a wonderful start. Um, I live in Qualicum Beach, and I used to think the skies here were pretty good until I realized you guys in Victoria have got it much better than I do, uh, lately anyway. So this is my uh, eight-inch uh, Dobsonian that I basically um, floundered with for the first, uh, well, all through 2019, um, trying to understand what the sky was. It, it really took me, I believe, six months to find Andromeda, trying to find my way around the sky. And, and uh, oh, I'm going to do this a sec here. I've got to get rid of this. So, Ron, did you yeah. do that just with books, or did you talk with people, or? Well, um, I, joined, I, joined, I joined RASC. Um, and I joined the Victoria Club and I joined the Nanaimo Astronomy Club. And so um, I actually made one trip, uh, the last meeting you guys had at UVic be before COVID started. That was my first trip down to Victoria to, to hear what was happening down there. And, and then COVID started. And, and uh, uh, between the RASC and the Zoom presentations and Explore the Universe and all that stuff, uh, that kept me really busy for uh, all of all of 2019 into into 2020, and it was when uh, uh, David Lee and John McDonald uh, uh, announced that they were putting together these uh, EAA and astrophotography groups that I thought I really wanted to learn that. Um, when I got this this scope that you see here. Um, I then bought my first book on, on astronomy, and the very first thing it said was, if you think you're going to be an astrophotographer, don't. Um, and and uh, <laughs> then I realized it was sort of complicated. I thought, I actually thought that I, I knew cameras, and I had lots of lenses and all that kind of stuff, but it wasn't until I sat quietly in the corner hiding uh, during all the sessions with uh, with John McDonald and and uh, um, and and David Lee and all the experts that were talking, that I realized I knew nothing, absolutely nothing. I didn't know what plate solving was, and it, I mean whatever they talked about, I knew nothing. So it was uh, 
it was a silent learning curve, so to speak. Um, my very first foray at photography was uh, I bought uh, um, a Skywatcher uh, uh, EQ6R Pro uh, mount, and I, di I, I didn't have anything to put on it. I tried putting my big, uh, uh, my big Skywatcher scope on it, and that it didn't get very far with it. But um, I, I put this rig on with my 300 millimeter telephoto and my DSLR and um, and a uh, an intervalometer, and I took uh, 60 30 second images of Andromeda after I found it. So this was my very first image that I ever did. Um, this wow. was wow. this was this was done trying to flounder through Pixinsight and and uh, managed to come up with this. And uh, this was in uh, September of 2021. And my wife liked it so much. She wrote the editor of the PQB newspaper up here, and uh, they interviewed me and published this photo. Uh, that was, they, you know, they were really happy that it was done from my backyard with an ordinary camera. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, so this, that was my first foray into, uh, into astrophotography. It was, uh, this was, uh, my second try was my son gave me uh, um, a, a Celestron 127 Mac a go-to mount that uh, he had bought and gave up on because he couldn't figure out how to make it work. So I uh, uh, I tried this right late in the season. I managed to get an image of, of the Orion Nebula, uh, very, very short 16, 60 second shots at that. And I felt pretty good about that. Um, but it wasn't until I really got involved with the uh, astrophotography groups that I started to understand where I wanted to go with it. So um, oh. this is my uh, my latest investment. I bought this, uh, I started to put this together last April. Um, and it was with so much help from uh, every everybody about uh, different types of scopes. And, and so I, I just want to very quickly go over what I got here. I started with an ASCAR uh, 500 millimeter uh, uh, focal length, 90 millimeter uh, um, APO, APO chromatic scope. And um, after listening to everybody I, I, and hearing about the stories about people getting cables tangled and all the rest of it, um, I figured I wanted to make sure that I could mount everything on the scope and make it easily transportable if I if and when I want to go anywhere. So that's the scope I bought. I bought uh, at the same time um, a uh, a 50 millimeter a guide master scope with with uh, a ZWO 120 MCS uh, a guide camera. Uh, this is the ZWO autofocuser and the ASIR Plus. And so I basically run everything through the ASIR Plus. Um, the only camera I use is my old uh, DSLR that I had modified. Uh, I sent it to Vancouver and, and had the uh, hydrogen alpha mod done on it. Um, and uh, you can see here, I bought, um, uh, a ZWO um, um, uh, rotator, a filter drawer, filter drawer, a filter drawer, and uh, an NB, an IDAS NBZ double uh, uh, narrow band filter to go with it. So it took me a while to figure all this stuff out. This, by the way, is just a, a red dot star finder that once in a while I use if I get lost in the sky everything everything works off the power well almost everything works off the power on the asi air pro um, including the camera because i very quickly learned that uh, 
you can't do uh, all night photography with a battery in the camera. So I bought uh, a power supply for my camera that plugs it into the ASIR Pro. And so that uh, has really helped me out. There's a thermometer or, or a, a temperature sensor also that plugs into this, which uh, uh, anyway, the long and the short of it is, uh, all I have to do is roughly align um, my mount, do a polar align roughly through the polar scope. And then I do everything else through the a ASI Air Pro and my smartphone. Uh, I do the polar align. I do, I do the plate solving, uh, um, all the planning, the autofocus and everything. And uh, it has made it so easy for me to, uh, to move into uh, the next phase. And, and I have to say to everybody there, um, I couldn't have done this without so many questions and so many answers and, and so much help from all of you guys. It just, uh, it probably saved me <laughs> a few thousand dollars of mistakes. Um, and, so, and Ron, so Ron, uh, Ron, this is what people call affectionately the slippery slope. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then, and then so, uh, uh, Brock, uh, Brock, Brock mentioned to me that uh, that this uh, uh, Ascar scope was a pretty good scope, and he mentioned that he had bought one from uh, David Astro uh, uh, in Montreal. And, and so I, I ordered through him and it was so good that he, he not only told me how to mount them, he took photographs of how he had pre-mounted this stuff and how I should put it together. And he sent me photos and everything. So it just, I had to figure out a few things with the mounts, but other than that, uh, uh, the help I got from everybody was just wonderful. Mm -hmm. And just you guys good. may notice that Ron is, now prof Ron is now proficient in talking in part numbers. <laughs> Ron, anyway so that uh, that's uh, that's the rig i've been playing with now since april uh, and just having a lot of fun with it um this was this was one of my first images i did with this uh m81 m82 uh, this is before i had autofocus and before i figured out a few other things about it but i was pleased i was pleased with that and and uh, uh, this this was twenty three hundred second exposures on this one. So after that, I added uh, uh, the autofocus and the and the filter drawer and the IDAS uh, NVZ dual band filter, uh, uh, and had the camera modified, and things started to come together for me. So. Uh, it, this was done in June, uh, the Pelican Nebula, and and uh, this was my first kick of, uh, with the NBZ filter. This was 2,680 second exposures. Um, everything I do, all the processing I do is in Pixinsight. And when I first got involved, I had no idea what I was doing, but I listened to everybody talk about Pixinsight and everything I looked at online said it seemed to be the way to go. So I thought, if I've got to start somewhere, I'll start with this and, uh, and uh, I'm gradually learning how to use it. So uh, I'm kind of pleased with my results so far. Um, this was uh, my first kick at the cat with the, the uh, uh, 0 0.7 reducer for my scope. Uh, this is the North American Nebula. And and uh, I was pleased with the results. And this this is really um, David Lee said you should try the wall. And and so that's that's why I went in and and uh, played with this one. This was sixty, uh, uh, sorry, fifty six hundred eighty second exposures. And uh, the elephant trunk nebula. Um, the one, one thing I, I, I uh, didn't figure out at first, I couldn't figure out what I was doing wrong. When I put the reducer on it, I forgot that that changes the focal length of the scope. And I just <laughs> couldn't, couldn't get 
the ASI air to work at all. Couldn't autofocus or anything. So that cost me a day or so trying to get that worked out. But uh, I, I did. I made that and, mistake. And I was pleased with the results. Um, this one here is the Soul Nebula. And uh, that was also done with the reducer. This, uh, th this is my first kick at the cat at uh, 840 second exposures. So 14 minute exposures. This is 27 uh, 14 minute exposures of the Sol Nebula and uh, processed in Pixensite. So Beautiful. this, yeah, this next one here is, uh, this is my first attempt at trying to figure out how to focus not on the target itself, but using uh, the uh, RA and DEC uh, um, input into into uh, um, my ASI air, and so I was pleased with this. This is also uh, uh, this is forty eight eight hundred and forty second exposures. So I was quite happy with with that. So just a question, Ron. Do you set up your scope every night on the driveway, um, or do you leave it set up? Um, well, we have such a nice summer for it. Uh, I, I don't, um, I have a, because I bought this new mouth and everything, with everything on it, it weighs about 75, 80 pounds. And my backyard was all uh, long before. And of course, you can't put it on that. And I wanted to use it in my backyard to get away from the street lights and that. So what we did was tear out all the grass in the back and, and uh, put, uh, a patio in there, a concrete patio. So I've, I've, I've got this big patio now where I can move my rig around and um, I've got a shed out there so I don't have to, you know, I'm getting on in, in, in years and it's not the easiest thing to pick up 80 or 90 pounds and move it around. So I've got a shed right there so I can open both doors and relatively easily move it in and out. So I just leave it outside at nighttime. I cover it over, but mind you, these were all, uh, these ones all ran all night long, all of these ones. So it, it's, not really a, it's not really a patio and shed, Ron, it's an observatory. Yeah, that's what they call it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and for like the, the quality you've got here, my friend, is astounding. Like, look at your stars. They're perfect, you know? They're perfect. Yeah, it's, uh, it's not bad. It's not bad. It's, it's not bad. It's not. It's very good. It's very good. Wow. <laughs> I'm. A, well, thank you, thank you. I. You know what? I have had so much fun. Um, I can only say that that uh, this would never have been possible if it had not been for uh, my involvement with with all of you guys and all the help you made uh, a seemingly impossible process. Uh, easy, easy to learn, and as I said before, I'm sure you saved me thousands of dollars in mistakes. I don't so. know. <laughs> <laughs> so I can. I can. I can. Hey, saying going broke, saving money. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway, that's all. That's that's all I have for tonight, and thank you for uh, your patience and listening to me. Very good. Thanks a lot, Ron. That's Thank you. really exciting. Um, and you, you really started from scratch in 2018? Yes. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. I started from scratch and, and uh, uh, it's just gotten better. I tell all of my grandkids, uh, I just, I just, to me, it's like going back to university again. I just love it. All the Zoom presentations and seminars and the scientists that we get to listen to. And, and there's just, anyway, I couldn't have had a better hobby. Thanks to my wife buying the first coat for me. And, and uh, Little did she know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, and she's, and she's very, uh, she's very, I just, uh, I don't know if you can see this or not, but I put together uh, a calendar for uh, for all of my grandkids and kids, so they're they're getting that for Christmas. My uh, my first calendar done with my images. 
Well, there you go. Wow. Fantastic. Anyway, thank you. Ron, I'm wondering, did you shop around for the equipment or have you chosen one store where you get everything? Oh no, I ended up shopping around with 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 COVID. I I uh, I priced stuff in Hong Kong. I bought a MBZ filter in in London. Couldn't find it here. Um, the guy at David Astro uh, helped me find some parts down in the states. He actually sent me the link to find parts because he couldn't get them. Um, and yeah, no, it was it was uh, uh, the majority of it came uh, from. Uh, from Montreal, but uh, no, I had to show up. Just for the people who don't know also, the filter that Sean's just talking about is a light pollution filter. It's one of the more exotic ones that have come up in the last couple of years. So uh, it's even in Polygon, there are, there's light pollution. I know our members here in Victoria have used it quite successfully as well, even if they live downtown. So, it's really changed the scene as far as asking the water is concerned what you can do. Yeah, I forgot to say one one last thing. If if anybody uh, was listening to what I had to say and is the slightest bit interested in getting into astrophotography, I gotta tell you, join these groups because there's so much knowledge and so many wonderful tips that you can pick up. And it's just, it's just a great way to learn. Anyway, that's my spiel. Thanks. And Ron, I was sure you were going to say, don't. <laughs> <laughs> See, Randy, you can do this. <laughs> well, it's that or eating, right? <laughs> Just compromise. <Not> priorities. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Ron. Um, so I was hoping that we could talk a bit this week about um, hopes and dreams about uh, gifts this holiday season. Uh, my, my real fantasy is that people would be here in person with all sorts of nice telescopes and books like we have seen in previous years, but it's going to take us a while to get back to the uh, the glory days, um, but um, other than Ron, you don't get any more. Uh, <laughs> what sort of things are people uh, either giving or hoping to receive, or are there books out there? Or little so, Ra Ra little Randy, things? I have uh, Randy, I have a few suggestions for. People that are kind of starting out um, got uh, two choices, two books. Yeah. So the fr the first one is um, just something called Stars and uh, Planets, and it's a good. Um, it's uh, put out by DK Smithsonian Handbooks, and it's it's quite small. So this is something you can carry with you. I I'm thinking about using this um, for outreach when people ask you how far away something is because it's it's just full of uh, lots of little stats and there's um uh kind of constellation guides as well in it so not too bad um uh, 26 dollars i guess I, th I think that's a that's a, a good choice uh aside from the rask um uh, almanac which is also excellent as well and my second one is a Quite a favorite book of mine. Uh, this is by um, uh, Sue French, and I don't know if people know her from her Sky and Telescope um, articles, but uh, the reason why I picked this is for people that don't have really large scopes, this is quite a nice guide. Um, it, uh, Sue French is well known for her use of uh, small refractors. So if you have like large binoculars or you have a small refractor, this is an excellent book. And again, she's got guides and uh, I've actually even heard of people using this uh, for planning their astrophotography. So this, this one's for you too, Ron, even though you're probably not allowed to have any more things. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, but, this, but this is a good book. Um, it has a lot, 
lot of um, kind of stories about each of the areas as well. So it's not just purely kind of like a reference uh, reference guide. So yeah, those two choices. Um, you can get these readily uh, at uh, Boland's, Boland Books and I think also in Monroe's. And then the only other one I would, um, I don't have it here, here with me. The only other one I would recommend for people that are using binoculars is uh, Gary Saronic's uh, Binocular Highlights book. So that's quite quite neat because it's targeted at, at binoculars. So that's what I got. Anybody else read a book that they think other people would like? Nobody's reading anything. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna plug a book. Go plug a book, Chris. Plug my book. Now, a lot of people got this book uh, uh, earlier in the year, but if you're still looking for one, I still have some kicking around the house. My uh, history of Hubble. And uh, so uh, let me know if you're looking for a copy and uh, all proceeds will go to the FDAO. So. Uh, uh, At what price? Oh, I don't know. It's uh, probably about 25 bucks, something like that. It's uh, fully illustrated and everything you wanted to know about Hubble, uh, we're afraid to ask. So uh, unless it happened the last two years. So uh, <laughs> anyway. It's very good. Yeah, I might take you up on that. Did you sign? So Rand Randy, oh. what did you bring? <laughs> oh boy. Randy, what did you bring? I brought the books on my shelf that um, I was keen to make some space with. I think one of the most attractive books for this season is I have Chris Hatfield's Murder Mystery. What's it called? The Apollo The Apollo Murders. Has anybody else read that? Yeah, I really right. enjoyed it. <laughs> it's a bit silly. It definitely, um, he is so keen to talk about what it's like to be an astronaut, and uh, then he fits a murder in there. And some of it is, shall we say, not believable, but that's okay. We, we don't need it to be totally realistic, but I certainly, I certainly had fun with it. Um, I brought my old copy of Silent Spring by Rachel Carson. Not because um, it's it's a book that uh, is you know I want to get rid of, but I read it and I think this is the sort of book that people should have. So if you don't know Rachel Carson, uh, before anybody thought about uh, environmentalism, uh, she study that was mostly about DDT, about the um, insecticide that uh, affected the eggs of, of birds. And she said, you know, it's not a big garbage can out there. And uh, it's, it's, it's actually a, a, a fine book. Um, what else did I bring? I brought a book by Davis Sobel and that one, it's, it's about the planets. And I love Davos Obel, but I must say that I brought this book because I don't like this one. <laughs> you want to get rid of it? I am crazy about Glass Universe, about longitude, about yeah. uh, Galileo's daughter. And so I bought this one thinking it would be great also. And it's, it's full of nice anecdotes, but it's not got that... Uh, really useful wow um, story that the other ones have, but I'm also not charging very much for it. Um, so those were what, at least for, for this crowd here. Oh, that's an interesting book. Alistair just picked up a book 
about what's it called? It's the day the world discovered the sun. It's about the two transects of Venus in the 18th century. So uh, some of us remember the last two uh, transects, which I don't know, about 20 years ago, 15 years ago. Um, but, uh, and then there was very well-studied ones in the 19th century. But uh, the first measurement that, that kind of gave us an accurate measure of uh, how far the Earth is from the sun, and by doing that, and with parallax, figuring out how far the stars are away, uh, was done by these very intrepid uh, uh, explorers and, and voyagers. This, this one focuses on a mission up to uh, oh the north of, of uh, Norway, Tahiti, and that was Captain Cook, and to the Gulf of Mexico. But there are several others that, that at the same time made the measurements. And uh, despite incredible hardship, they actually came up with a pretty good number. And to, thanks to the uh, time, key, time pieces that they took with them, which were new technology. Right, 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 right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, actually new proper time and chronometers. Okay, but they did, they did set up um, observatories yeah. and for, for um, each of them. And they would, you know, look at, I forget what sort of things they used to set their clocks, but they did have, um, you know, they, they set up months enough early that they could see some occultations and things that uh, helped set their, their clocks. Yeah, big at the time would have been the um, shadow transits of the Jovian satellites, because yeah. that, that was the competing method to right. the clocks. Yeah. yeah. I'm just saying, Joe, we can't hear you when you speak. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> or we can't hear you very well. Okay, come on. Somebody read a book. Somebody got a nice gizmo. <laughs> or wants a nice gizmo. Or wants <laughs> a nice gizmo. Yeah, what do you tell your, your, your sweeties that you, what you want and your name isn't Ron? This <laughs> is very hard. You can't you can't say, you know, I want something for my telescope because you already have most of the things that you want. I I have one thing. I, I have asked for the impossible. Oh yeah. Time. <laughs> and clear skies. Yes. <laughs> well, if I have time, eventually I'll have enough clear sky. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so I've got a book here that I'm reading right now that I bought a year or so ago. That is just fascinating. Uh, I don't know if you can see that. Um, it's called All These Worlds Are Yours, The Scientific Search for Alien Life by, by John Willis. And it's super interesting. It covers all aspects from the very early days to, well, mind you, only up till uh, about three years ago, four years ago kind of thing. So it hasn't kept up to date with the latest trackings and that, but it's it's everything from uh, looking at exoplanets to uh, monitoring for radio signals for alien life. And anyway, it's really interesting if anybody's interested in it. Thank you. Well, I think we should move to the next topic. And Alistair, really, are you um, able to tell us something about, like, what do you do in Edmonton to get together these days? Um, the Edmonton Centre has, uh, well, finally shifted to hybrid meetings. And um, the, the, well, we, we have um, also, um, observers group meetings, so not quite cafes. We have cafes that are sort of uh, built upon this 
very idea, but are not quite the same. Uh, we also have uh, someone who does, uh, Jeff Robertson, who does a What's Up in the Sky this month. That one um, is uh, very neat uh, for two reasons. Uh, the first one is, um, well, every time you see a phenomenon as, oh, from the Globe and Mail or from the New York Times or whatever, such and such an event is visible from, no, no, it's, it's not visible from Edmonton. Or, um, you know, it, it'll be very poorly located. Actually, it's really quite high for Edmonton. So um, it, it's, uh, uh, he sort of really stresses, what can we see from here that you might not see from um, the, uh, uh, from, from other places. So in some cases, oh, there's this great uh, elongation of mercury. And it's like, well, the ecliptic from here is like that. And <laughs> no, you're, you're don't, just don't bother. Uh, um, but uh, the, um, uh, we, we've, um, yeah, we've moved into the hybrid format uh, of our main meetings. Um, and um, I, I'm a bit disappointed that they've kind of really split the, the crowd, like instead of uh, um, 100, 110 people uh, right. at our meetings. Every week? No, no, uh, once a month, pre-COVID, okay. yeah. um, at the, the, month, the main monthly one. Um, we, it, it was, it's now like 30, 60, 30 people at the meeting and 60 online or something like that. And um, you know, so that's sort of, a little disappointing, especially after two years where you sort of want to get to see people face to face, um, you know, and say hello again and, and, and sort of start to amping up the enthusiasm. So it's um, so, you know, not, not really sure where this is going to go in terms of uh, um, like there, there's obviously um, the, the hybrid is great for people who are uh, you know, a, a 50 minute drive from Edmonton. It's just like, great, I'm just going to stay home and watch. And then, well, there are people that are, you know, a, a um, 15 minute drive or something like that. And it's like, oh, I'm just going to stay home. Like, you know, it'd be kind of nice to, to actually yeah. get that one-on-one. Um, -on -one. So uh, we'll, we'll see how that goes. But you didn't have any issues getting your meeting place back. No, no, uh, 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 we're, we're very fortunate. We have a very uh, uh, a top rate um, coordination with the TELUS World of Science, Edmonton. And so we are in the, the Planetarium Star Theater. And so we've got the, whatever it is, 1500 watts per channel sound system. If, if, if <laughs> yeah, we need it. Been, uh, been, well, I gave a talk there not long ago, so. Yeah, um, and, um, yeah, and and when uh, when someone pre presents, even someone uh, remotely presents, it it comes up on in in well, three three sectors, and when they point the laser pointer at one of them, it also shows up on the other sectors as well. So it doesn't matter where you are. So that's that's really nice. Um, and uh, but uh, yeah, we're we're kind of. Have uh, you got your new center observatory going? Um, all, well, the, the observatory. <laughs> the observatory is there. The, the building observatory is there. Is there. The, the building is there. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, Black Nugget Lake, east of Edmonton, um, at a provincial campground. But it's uh, the ground itself is co-owned by the county. And, um, well, we are installing um, uh, Bob Drew's 32-inch uh, uh, scope and uh, one of the, um, uh, the you know the the key uh, builders um, shoot I'm Roman kidding. Roman, Roman yeah. Eunuch has been doing encoders and everything and um, we it we were hoping to have first light at the the last star party uh, but uh, just a few too many. Um, well, it's not quite good enough for us, so we have to um, uh, do some custom work and or COVID supply chains and so on. But we're, we're looking to uh, have our first uh, unofficial first light uh, uh, by summer. So uh, 
Uh, yeah, I mean, well, you guys have looked through the DAO here, so you know what uh, aperture can uh, mm -hmm. can deliver on things like globular star clusters. And yeah. Yeah, the last I heard, uh, Roman was having some wiring issues, and he wanted to get them resolved before they moved the scope out of his garage. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, we're the the oh, and and um, it, it's uh, well, I was going to say it's deliberately a visual scope. It is designed to be able to have future modular uh, add-ons uh, for it to be <coughs> an imaging instrument. But um, part of the thing is, hey, we've got people doing all sorts of imaging all over the place. You know, what are you going to do more with, you know, a scope that's, well, twice the size or three times the size of a 10 or 12 inch uh, uh, system, you, you know, you're, yeah, you're going to be able to go deeper, but um, it was really intended as a visual, you know, punch the back of your head out views of, uh, uh, of galaxies, galaxy clusters, like we're, we're really looking forward to, uh, you know, looking into the heart of the whirlpool or um, at, uh, you know, the, the, the coma, uh, a bell cluster where it's just you know, oh, there's too many galaxies. I can't even count that high. Uh, so, you know, really looking forward to that. And um, well, we also, um, you, you know, and, and you know, the, looking at the Veil Nebula almost as good as the Hubble Space Telescope sort of thing, where you're just seeing all this filamentary stuff. Uh, I've seen the Veil in a in a 40 inch scope, and it's just an outstanding. Uh, so, uh, you know, really look. <laughs> Really looking forward to uh, uh, having that uh, in operation. Uh, so, uh, uh, and and it's uh, part of the we, we've got it because of casino money. Um, all those poor sods out there who are uh, probably uh, spending more than what they actually have, but uh, uh, we're reaping the benefit. And uh, um, about every three years, we get eighty thousand dollars worth. Wow! But we have to spend it in the public interest. Uh, we can't just go and do a members only something. So like this telescope is going to be available, uh, available to the public in the sense of public star nights. Um, and that, that and, and we're just like, well, we have to have a certain ratio of those available to the public in order to have it, uh, well, ethically that we're using justify public. Justify the money. Yes, <laughs> justify the, that, that, that we're spending the money. But uh, yeah, we're, Really looking forward to that. Wow. Well, one of the things that Alistair didn't mention is that on demand, or as, as he do cars, he runs scope clinics for people who don't know how to operate or get their scopes aligned on behalf of the club. Yeah. Uh, yeah. One of the, uh, well, yeah, our club also has, uh, because we're right next, co located with the Science Center uh, for, well, many, many decades now. Um, they have an outdoor observatory, a split apart roof, and the equipment was mostly funded by these casinos. So we actually have like Terence Dickinson's original seven inch star fire. Uh, we now have uh, a 14 inch plane wave. Uh, there's the C, you know, a Mead 16 inch Schmidt cast, but that's kind of mushy. <laughs> Um, but a uh, um, couple of solar scopes. Uh, yeah, a couple of solar scopes, the, you know, the Lunt uh, double stack uh, stuff with calcium line filters and H alpha. And so it's a really good program. Half the volunteers are RASC members. The other half are uh, just um, people who have volunteered to be at the uh, TELUS World of Science. Uh, Pre-COVID uh, in summer, that was open uh, seven days a week and seven nights a week. Uh, but now we're, uh, well, especially as we head into winter, we're just um, two nights a week um, and uh, two, the Saturday, Friday night, Saturday night, and uh, uh, Saturday day is all that we've got the volunteer time uh, available for. Every and week. Every week. Wow. Uh, well, and of course it's weather, weather dependent. Weather dependent. If, yeah. If it's uh, the 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 break point is about minus twelve, it's no fun for anyone. Even, <laughs> you know, even if you're well dressed in that, it's got, well. If we have an exciting event like well, the Mars opposition coming up, uh, will be open midweek. 
you know, well advertised um, around the city. So we expect uh, to, to see quite a few people, of course, you know, and, and there's, uh, it's a great outreach event. So we'll have uh, uh, members bringing their own scopes uh, in order to uh, uh, mitigate the, the, the lineup because we've had Mars opposition stuff before and it's it's a two hour wait and yeah, just nuts. And so we've got extra telescopes. Well, while you're waiting for that, we'll keep <laughs> your spot in line. Come and have a look through a C8 or uh, something like that. Um, and uh, given the, the the turbulence in the skies, the the uh, an eight inch Smith cast is all, is pretty much as good as the plane wave fourteen, anyways. Uh, but um, it's right smack in the middle of town. Yeah, it's, it's a reasonable amount of light pollution around. It all is a good part. Of yeah, yes. That, it'll be fine for the yeah. occultation. Yeah. But yeah. Oh, okay. so it's, it's, not, it's it, not minus twenty five. Yeah, and and it won't be. It's like my, it'll be like minus five. Is yeah. the point? Yeah. 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 Lucky yeah, you. it's 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 minus twenty five tonight. Yeah. But in two nights, it should be like minus uh -huh. five or minus seven. I'll hey, that's that's. It go. <laughs> it, it, it's every now and then someone will say, you know, it's like, oh, it's getting chilly, and just like, well, if that's chilly, and you throw in summer twilight, when are you observing? Uh, <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, uh, so so back pre COVID, um, what what I did was on the the, the Saturday night. It was, if it was looking good, um, we put out an announcement and it's like, well, there's three one hour slots available. If you've got a telescope and you can't figure out how to use it, bring it to the science center and, you know, we'll, we'll get it working. You'll get a, a one hour one-on-one -on -one tutorial. And so that, I mean, the, the idea of that was really um, to, um, well, try and mitigate the well-known um, one-year turnover of RASC members. And, you know, so hopefully, you know, if you show someone how to use something, well, like uh, 40 years ago, no more uh, for me, uh, <laughs> someone showed me how to use my scope and yeah. away I went and here I am now. So it's, there's always a, a hope that, you know, some of that one-on-one -on -one time will germinate a seed in there and and, and okay. get the next round of uh, volunteers. An important related question as we are looking for people who are willing to step up to be on our uh, board of directors. How are you guys doing getting people who are willing to run the club? We, we've got a, a, a full group this year. Um, yeah, we it's like we 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 found the all important uh, um, uh, treasurer, <laughs> and I, I, I won't I won't I shouldn't say that, but that may be a boon for us at some point because we may acquire their old treasure. I'm going to be twisting Florence's arm. Oh, <laughs> um, but um, yeah, so so it's it's uh, we we've got uh, yeah a, a full group and. Uh, the the incoming president, um, what he's um, his sort of well mission for his uh, upcoming tenure is to try and um, really put um, meat to the um, uh, the, the um, inclusivity of uh, of the different uh, cultures that we have. Uh, in the city, because, uh, you know, it's the usual, yep, uh, a whole bunch of gray and white people, you know, as you look at the, uh, you know, who shows up. And um, so we, we've got some, we, we've got a reasonable proportion of women, which is great, but uh, we still have, uh, you know, shortcomings on the, the sort of the, the visible minority side who are, uh, you know, it's, there there's a, an awful lot of, uh, uh, of folk in the city and and uh you know i see it at the science fairs you've got you know kids of uh, you know of all colors uh doing science and uh just like well you know where are they when it comes to you know hitting high school and, and universities that you know we should get a trickle of some of them but we don't seem to be yeah, big old. and uh part of that well i mean there's a lot i won't go on too much other than my uh, you know, my main thought is, uh, um, you, you know, you show up at a place and you realize there's nobody here that, of my age or that looks like me. Uh, uh, it's not that they're unwelcome. It's just, I think there's a sort of a, uh, I'm out of here. Yeah. 
uh, before we can even really interact. So I think that's a, a crucial problem that we're facing across the country. Yeah, that's a big one. Thank you, Alistair. <laughs> I'm sorry for putting you on the spot, but oh. I'm very sorry, because that was really useful. And that setup they have, at, uh, their telescope set up at Telus World of Science is most impressive. I happen to be in Edmonton for a couple of days in August, and I just happen to be in that area. So I just popped in out of the blue and did some solar observing, uh, you know, really, and looking at the setup uh, you guys have there, it's really great for for anybody, but I'll, you know, for public outreach, it's uh, fabulous. And, and as Alistair spoke about the public events, because it's in the middle of the town, uh, and we have a, we barely have a pretty reasonable contact with the press. If there's something going on of interest in the sky, the news gets around pretty quick, and people show up. Yeah, I know for Hale Bob, I was out there <laughs> like eight nights, and I estimate I had three thousand people look through my telescope. Yoy. Yeah, and, and you know, one of the sort of interesting side notes about the, the, the public observatory, um, and, and it's free of charge, uh, even though, you know, internal to the, to the TELUS World of Science, of course, you have to pay to see the shows and, and the exhibits, but the observatory itself, uh, walking through that is, is free. Uh, but uh, one of the, uh, our uh, uh, longtime members, Bruce McCurdy, when, when he would do some of the summer ones, uh, he'd often uh, have, uh, well, on the chalkboard, uh, something, a keyword like sun or star, and then say, you know, uh, you know, what is this word in your language? And we've seen like 50 languages come across wow. the, the, the table. And uh, so it's like, we, there's a really big throughput through there. And, and so you know that that is sort of one of the again the, one of the disappointments where you've got all these cultures coming through and but they're not sticking at least you know with us of course some people will be on holiday or most might be but you'd still kind of expect a little bit of more sticking mm -hmm. and that's you know something we've got to try and and, and work on a bit more um that's not what i want to do I just wanted to uh, show a single picture. Let's go here. There we go. So uh, Alistair was talking about the occultation of Mars and we're gonna have to complain to Reg. He's not even on today. Uh, the, the weather is not <laughs> looking very good. There's a huge bank of, um, of rain. Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be raining like crazy, and there's this huge bank coming in off the Pacific that looks like it just wants to hang over us for the next couple of days. But, especially if your name is David Lee, you're probably going to look for a little break. <laughs> and find it. Anyway, so with, with, with uh, <laughs> Stellarium, I, I, this is the times for, for, uh, for us. So it's uh, just before... Seven o'clock on Wednesday evening, and the actual going from first contact to being completely behind. Uh, I read somewhere it's about 35 seconds. Um, but that's pretty cool. I and I have to say, I did have the honor of being out with David on a previous occultation at four in the morning on King George Terrace. And you got the most winner photograph that that time. The cloud just parted at the right time, and and when when Mars came out, and it's it's a beautiful photo. Uh, also, Mars is at opposition, which means it is as close as it gets to Earth. So th this is well, maybe you should go to Edmonton. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so just before seven. It's so at, at uh, what at seven minutes before seven is when it's going in and it's coming out at uh, 10 to eight. Okay, so it takes about an hour to get across. And uh, it's going from the west to the east. So, you know, everything moves 
from the east to the west, but the moon does it faster, right? The moon is close. And so it's going to overtake Mars. And so that's why it goes from the west of Mars, of, of moon, over to the east, comes out around the uh, Maricrisium, the Sea of Crises. Okay. Um, and I guess all we're going to be able to do is take a look at other people's pictures. Are there nice any? Very really nice if somebody had it online. <laughs> <laughs> this this is your 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 computer aided astronomy there, David. <laughs> <laughs> you need to find somebody out there who's got a clear sky. <laughs> Well, I'm sure there will be people yeah. with it on with yeah, it online. Yeah, usually there's things like that that crazy Italian um, Gianfranco, who what's his last name, does the um, the virtual telescope in Rome, and uh, I'm pretty sure that it is visible in Rome because if it's that early here, it'll be the middle of the night over there. Yeah, it's nine hours. So I managed to get a picture of Mars last night. It was clear hey. for a few minutes. So. <laughs> you yeah. gonna show us? Sure. When when was it clear, Brock? I went outside. It was all cloudy. It was uh, about uh, seven to eight or something like that. Uh, oh. Yeah, I miss I miss and, uh, my moon It was the seeing was atrocious, but. Uh, <laughs> Let me uh, yeah, share this. It was, it was clear up in Sydney last night in the early evening, but you're right, the, the scene was a trophy. Oh, well, that's, that's not too bad. Yeah. Oh, polar cap and everything. You can see a bit. Just, yeah. Um, yeah, there's a bit of polar cap and a little bit of detail. But I just for entertainment, I also included the video here so you can see how bad the scene <laughs> is. Yeah, yeah. It was... Brock, Brock, what's the name of the dark feature? I think it's Sirtis something. I, I, I don't know. Pardon, pardon me. Top of my head. I don't I know. I can't remember called. the name. That well, that's what's on the left hand side. On the left hand side. Yeah, yeah, that's Sirtis. It's called Lucky Imaging. <laughs> yep, Lucky so, Imaging. So, so, what time was that? Yesterday. What time was it? Yeah. It was somewhere, I think, between seven and eight. I don't remember exactly. Okay, it hadn't rotated around yet. Yeah, yeah. When I went out at nine o'clock, it was uh, totally sucked in. Yeah, it was really nice on Saturday night. It was really nice on Saturday. Night. The seeing was really good too. I was looking at Mars yeah. at three hundred times. It was holding up steady. I didn't have any. I couldn't see it. It was cloudy. I had everything set up. I just what time? Got... Well, I'm out in the west. I have different yeah, weather yeah. than you. Different weather. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, you photographers. I thought that uh, when when you had the conjunction of Jupiter and Moon, it was spectacular. Like it was, you couldn't not look up at it, and and. You know, non astronomers were saying, wow. And then you take a picture and it is so disappointing. <laughs> now, I know, I mean, I, I'm a big believer that the eye is able to see things that the uh, camera can't see. I, I, I rejoice in that. But <laughs> is there no way to like fake it to make it look interesting? Well... Well, the common but, trick, the common trick, uh, Randy, is often to use uh, insets. I take advantage of that a lot. Yeah, um, yeah, I saw, but, I saw somebody do that. Yeah, still not. I mean, you just the naked eye view. It's still, it's different from through a telescope. It's, it's just different. Yeah, mm -hmm. it is I, different. I got came out of choir rehearsal and I said, "Look at that." <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, one of the things I, I tell people a lot, especially for the lunar eclipse, is binoculars are by far my favorite. It's, yeah. you know, I, I still have my scope there to get a closer look, but it's just that perspective that the binoculars, the two eyes, especially your brain works really yeah. well. And it's just that, ah, that's nice. <laughs> Maybe your brain does. <laughs> <laughs> 
I think I think the other thing, uh, looking through a telescope, it's it's kind of borderline immersive as well. Like as long as you kind of shield all the light around when you're looking. Uh, I mean, I often use like my uh, 55 millimeters super wide and uh, I can sort of fill the view with the moon. And if I'm looking at an occultation, basically, if I put something over my head or something, make sure everything is black, it kind of becomes really immersive. And then it, it it's, I think it's more epic for me that way. It's also taking time to, to you don't just do it with a quick glance. Yeah. Uh, whenever I'm doing public outreach and you're looking at the moon or Saturn or whatever, I always tell the people who are coming up to the scope to don't rush away, stand there, <laughs> take five minutes if you want, because mm -hmm. your your brain processes like the computer does. You're seeing the image with this thing and not necessarily just with your eyes. What is the dynamic range of the eye? Does anybody know if it were, you know, oh, how many handbook. how many bits <laughs> would, it, would it would it be sure. equivalent to? I, I we need to have Dorothy here. I, I'm not a biologist, so I I don't really know. Uh, I just I just know perceptually. Um, what may be happening is we may be, um, I don't know, viewing it uh, maybe in different modes, uh, but continuously maybe even, that somehow that kind of extends extends the exposure. Because I know that when I'm out on a sunny day, if I look into the shadow, it's, it's almost um, instantaneous that I can see detail in the shadow and flipping back to, to the highlight, to the totally lit area. So it's very, very fast. I don't know if that's part of the thing. Uh, yeah. Obviously, with a sensor, you're limited. You either get one side or the other. Yeah, with with, with uh, Earth shine on the crescent moon, you never mm -hmm. can get get that with a single exposure. Yeah, yeah. It's it's difficult unless uh, it's one of the cre really extreme crescent phases, and then it's dominantly dark, and then you let the 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 bright strip just kind of overexposed, but the bulk of it will be the earth shine. Well, I do have a presentation on just what you're asking for, Randy, that I could switch together on how the eye sees and, and uh, like, like, a, like a camera can get the earth shine. But so, you so Dave, is this a uh, five minute thing or a longer? It's, it's, no, it's, 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 next it's week. longer. It's longer than that. But, uh, but I think we should give you lots of time and do it another Yeah, do a cafe, do a cafe. Yeah, yeah, that, 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 that. Sure. I'll, I, I, I would I'll love that. to see it, but we are getting close to nine o'clock. Yeah. And we have promised David time. And uh, I think- oh, I'm, I, wasn't, I wasn't volunteering right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. But, but we would love that one, Dave. Okay. The other thing too is a uh, telescope is that's a, uh, a calculator in it and it will calculate the uh what the eye does too yeah but the gist of it is it's limited at the top end when your rods and cones get saturated so there's a limit to how bright you can see something and at the bottom and, end the eye actually can detect single photons yeah but you you, you need more than one to put a picture. Or one together. can form an image, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, that, that that's a good observation. Uh, we have more than one receptor in our eye, which is different from a sensor, unless it's a very specialized sensor. They they all more or less uniformly behave the same way, whereas we have these two mechanisms in our eye. Ganglions. So, David. Want to talk about uh, six? Yeah, yeah. If I if I could, uh, please. Uh, so this this week, um, uh, we've got uh, the beginners group or the getting started in astronomy group for tomorrow night. And uh, in the absence of any kind of um, uh, kind of topics or constellations to talk about, I thought uh, we have a few new people in the group. So I thought it'd be nice, uh, it'd be good to just go back through the basics. So tomorrow night, I'm going to talk a little bit about magnitude because uh, there's often a little bit of confusion about uh, apparent magnitude, what, what those things mean, and things 
things like absolute magnitude. So we'll talk a little bit about that and a little bit about the history of how that evolved. Um, in subsequent um, sessions, I think I'm going to go over some of the catalogs, the different kind of catalogs we have, because for a, a, a given object in the sky, there are numerous synonyms for it. I mean, numerous catalog uh, differences, and people are often confused by that too. So I thought we'd have a little bit chat about those two things in the next little while. Um, on That's on Tuesday, that's tomorrow night. Um, I believe I'm fairly up to date with the uh, distribution. So anybody who's requested it uh, has been sent an invite. Uh, if you still think like tonight that you might not be on that list or you haven't already received something, uh, send um, an email to david at victoria.rasc.ca and uh, I'll make sure you get on the list before tomorrow night. Uh, on Thursday, uh, we have the uh, Electronically Assisted Astronomy Group. And uh, I've had some feedback. I got some feedback from Brock recently. And uh, I would tend to agree that it, it's, it's kind of a topic which is neither here nor there. It, it is interesting from a technical point of view, but we haven't had a lot of um, uh, uptake on, on doing it. I, I guess if you really like astrophotography, you go all the way. You don't go part way. And the people that observe probably don't want to go to that next step. So it's kind of like um, an in-between state. But uh, I think what I'm going to do is I may move that into the uh, getting started group for those people that might be a little adventuresome. Uh, so we, we, will, we will do it there. And not a lot has really changed in terms of the technology associated with that. So we probably could maybe... Uh, I, I would only do it on requests now. I think that's what I'm suggesting, but we will meet one more time uh, this Thursday. Now, as you know, um, I'm thinking about starting a citizen science group. So it will probably replace uh, citizen science or probably replace EAA. Um, I'm working on a presentation. I mentioned it to Jeff. Uh, he's going to be hosting in January sometime. So I'm going to start uh, talking a little bit about uh, what citizen science is in astronomy, and uh, we will probably kick off that group in the new year. Now, the very last thing I, I want to talk about is um, I got a request uh, last week uh, from Aaron Bannister. Uh, some of you may know him from uh, uh, being on uh, sort of the virtual uh, star parties from the FDAO. Uh, uh, he, he certainly has had a, a huge following in terms of uh, engaging kids with uh, constellations and folklore and things like that. Uh, but he asked me, he said, well, David, would you uh, help out uh, uh, with the kids? Because some of the, the kids at the school, now Aaron teaches at a, an alternative school in town. Uh, it's called the Pacific School of Innovation and Inquiry. Um, they have a, um, they, they have a regular curriculum as well, but they have this, um, strategy in terms of learning that the kids can decide that they might be interested in something and then they will get somebody with uh, skills that can maybe show them how to do this thing that they want to do so i guess aaron must have got them interested in astrophotography and he he suggested well a lot of the kids want to do that so we started off i looked at it and i know that the the kids really have limited resources in in terms of equipment so i thought maybe maybe the most appropriate thing would be uh, kind of nightscape and maybe tracker-based kind of photography. So I'm expecting, I have a number of uh, spare trackers around. So uh, given a clear night, uh, I think we can probably go out uh, maybe with some of their equipment on trackers and maybe, uh, maybe capture maybe M31, M45, uh, M42. Uh, but the weather isn't cooperating right now. Uh, so what my request for you, for the for the people that do astrophotography, is uh, if you have any existing data where you would be willing to uh, sort of uh, supply some calibration frames and light frames that the students could work with to learn processing, I would very much appreciate that. Um, also, uh, because it is a school that would wouldn't have you know extreme resources, uh, I've decided that maybe we should try something like. Uh, Cyril, because there's no licensing implications to it. So th this is a um, a request to you, Brock, whether or not you'd be willing to participate and maybe help out with 
maybe sure. some tutorials with the kids or something like that? Yeah, I could do that. I think we should also get the development builds of Cyril because they have all sorts of yeah nice so things that are... so i i've already started my discussion with aaron but uh maybe what i'll do is he he was going to introduce the kids to what may be possible uh today so i haven't heard back from him mm -hmm. but as soon as i i get some feedback from him maybe we'll call a meeting for anybody who's interested we'll call a meeting and see what we as uh, a community could uh supply the school because i think it's a great opportunity i mean these these people are really interested mm -hmm. uh they they just want to develop some skills and i think that's something that uh, i am more than happy to promote and uh i um uh, i have to admit you know if there was an alternative school when i was younger i probably would have gone to it because i i, I I'm, I'm not a classic student uh like i i, I tend to probably play around too much <laughs> and experiment too much but maybe that's not a bad thing for a lot of things um so uh yeah it, it'd be great if we can maybe uh, supply some uh, uh, some technical knowledge to to the students and also maybe some inspiration of what they could do with it. Mm -hmm. So again, uh, send me a note uh, to uh, david at victoria.grass.ca if you have some interest in helping out and I will keep you in the loop. Thank you very much. Right, you're welcome. Um, this is the... Uh, anti-penultimate Astro Cafe of the Year. We have, uh, next week is the 12th. I will be late, why? Because Alistair invited me to talk to the uh, Edmonton group, give my lunar talk. So um, that, that will be starting at 6.30, so I'll be here. I haven't decided if I'm coming in person or if it goes too late, then I'll just come in online. Um, and then the 19th. And then on, uh, when we start in January, uh, which will likely what be the 9th. Do you, do you know, Chris? I believe so, yes. Yes. We are, um, we're going to change to seven in, at evening. Turns out most evening events in Victoria are happily working at seven. And we do have this deadline here of nine o'clock. Then they're very, they're very nice. They don't bug us when we go late, but the custodians really would like to uh, go home to their families. So if we started half an hour earlier, then um, it means that we'll have more time, just the people who are here in person, uh, We'll be able to to yammer a bit without uh, inconveniencing our, our hosts. So uh, we hope that people are uh, willing and able to to accommodate this change. I understand, Joe, that we're going to have to uh, start our own recordings. Um, but you know what? We can do it. We can grow up and learn it ourselves. <laughs> uh, yeah, I can still post. I just don't. You, you can't start it. No, just, no, but you record it, record the whole thing. Just give it to me later. Yeah. To post. Well, that, that's a really kind offer. Uh, anything, any closing notes? Oh, Laurie, Laurie, Laurie. Um, hi there. I just wanted to um, also uh, tell people that uh, the um, the Sunshine Coast um, right. RESC, which is over in in Gibsons, um, is uh, having P uh, Peter Broughton, who is a um, expert on uh, uh, John Stanley Plaskett and the working of of uh, his life and what he did with the uh, with the um, telescope at the DAO and the building of it, all that kind of thing. He wrote the he wrote the the book, um, the Northern Star. Have I got Northern that right? Star? Yes. Yes, and, and recently um, won a, a very prestigious award, by the way, from the uh, oh, did he? Uh, from the uh, historical section of the American Astronomical. Uh, oh well, I I'm not surprised, but he's going to so he's going to be giving a talk this coming Friday night. 
uh, starting at, I think the the this, the place starts at seven. They're they're meeting, and Peter is actually going to be present uh, in in the Sunshine Coast there. And uh, and I asked whether or not we could be invited in um, in order to uh, be on on the online uh, part of it, and they said very much so. I have sent the link to um, Chris, who was very kindly. Um, I put it out in the uh, in the bulletin that just went out um, that just went out on Saturday. Um, and if anybody uh, if anybody is interested, um, that you can just actually go on to the uh, Sunshine Coast, the RASC Sunshine Coast site, and uh, and it's right. Uh, you know, it's kind of one of the ones the for the events. It's just right there. Um, so that will be that will be really kind of interesting if you're if you've got if you want to have a little bit of history next. Uh, next Friday night, and then the following Saturday, uh, we will be having the the friends of the DAO will be having um, our uh, our uh, star party on Saturday the seventeenth, and uh, and our very own Nathan um, Helmer Messelman it will be the speaker. Um, so I would really encourage everybody to come out and give him some support, and uh, and listen to his uh, presentation. He has a he has a really interesting one that he is giving on um, on how we look at our cosmos. Uh, so um, please uh, please join in to our star party. You can I can give you the Zoom link, um, uh, but we could also also just simply join on on our YouTube as well at the same time. So that's on the seventeenth. So thanks, everybody. Could I ask what the calendar situation is? Um, you can ask. Um, <laughs> um, I was actually thinking I need to kind of call Stephanie because we've we've got. I mean, the the thing went in. Um, we've got the bill. Uh, Deb Crawford is paying it, um, but we don't have them yet. So I'm going to have a nice little quiet chat with Stephanie. Michalak and find out um, find out where they are. I am so sorry, everybody. They must have showed up in Edmonton because we have an extra 100, which we're returning. Oh my gosh. Well, that's maybe um, you've got ours. Who knows? Didn't they send each order twice to the center? Yeah. Yes. But we haven't gotten either of the ones that they sent to us. Yeah. Run no, those. so I'm not. So anyway, I just I really honestly didn't think this would happen this year because other people had had the had had them for quite a long time. And um, some centers got them well back in October. So I, I anyway, I apologize again, everybody. And if I can, I will be trotting out everybody, everybody on the 24th of December. I will be going to everybody's house handing them handing you handing you calendars. So hope not. But that's what we'll do. Okay, thank you. Uh, just before we go, I'll give a, like about a 30 second update on Artemis. Uh, Good. We, I can't, uh, there's some, uh, yesterday it, it, it had a burn that took it out of its kind of remote lunar orbit. It actually spent most of that orbit well away from the moon. And this morning it made a close passage to the moon. I've seen a couple of really neat pictures uh, from it. Uh, but I don't have them on me right here. Uh, and uh, so now it's on its way home and it will be getting back to Earth, I think on December 11th, which I think is Sunday. Uh, and uh, I hope that uh, there'll be more pictures uh, posted. There's, uh, NASA has, has uh, yeah, um, uh, we've got, uh, a picture here, maybe it'll just come up in a minute. We'll come uh, up very quickly. Of a of a crescent earth rise. Um and uh, uh the I I did see the status report this afternoon and uh, everything seems to be working fine. So there you can see uh uh the crescent earth, the crescent moon, and and uh, the crescent part of uh, the uh, Artemis spacecraft, the Orion spacecraft. So uh, anyway, and uh, there's some other pictures, and I hope uh, more will be released as time goes on. I, apparently, they have limited bandwidth, so they have not uh, downloaded everything. So that's uh, that's Artemis. And one more thing is um, uh, tomorrow night, uh, 
I'm going to be uh, sort of going into my way back machine and thinking what I was doing 50 years ago on that night, which was watching the final Apollo watch the moon. Um, and uh, it was uh, it was sort of after midnight on the night of December 6th, going into the 7th. Uh, I happened to be in Edmonton that day watching it. And of course, uh, there is uh, uh, one of the most spectacular explorations of the moon uh, in the valley of uh, Taurus Litro. And there's, uh, I've just forgotten, there's a NASA site or, uh, that they put up, which you can follow the, the mission in kind of real time if you want. Uh, uh, and uh, I'll, uh, I'll 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 post it up when I get home. It's they've done this for a couple of missions for uh, for uh, Apollo eleven, of course, and Apollo thirteen, and Apollo seventeen. And it's just an amazing sight. You can listen to all the uh, the chatter between the spacecraft, kind of in 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 real time, except fifty years later, of course. <laughs> And uh, all the various loops in the control center and whatever pictures they've taken or film or television uh, comes down kind of in, in real time. So uh, um, anyway, that's an anniversary to think about. And uh, uh, even as even as Artemis is going, you know, it's in the area, but it doesn't have people on board, but I'm hoping we will have people going back there soon including a Canadian, by the way, who will be on Artemis too. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, an important topic, which we didn't cover, and I would love to next week, is to remember David Bennett, who died last week. Uh, I will have the honor of visiting his widow on Thursday because she's keen to clear up part of the garage, and so, um, and it's close to where I work, so I'll get a chance to uh, kind of inventory. She really doesn't um, know even what's there, so that that will be uh, on Thursday. But next Monday, if people uh, have photographs or uh, stories about um, this memory, I don't think I ever crossed paths with with him since I've joined the club but uh, the number of tributes that came in uh, by the emails were just beautiful and so I'd really like to hear some stories about this obviously uh, cherished member of our club okay uh, and with that look forward to seeing you next week <laughs>